Hello, friends. My name's Tammy Simon, and I'm the founder of Sounds True, and I want to welcome you to the Sounds True podcast, Insights at the Edge. I also want to take a moment to introduce you to Sounds True's new membership community and digital platform. It's called Sounds True One. Sounds True One features original, premium, transformational docu-series, community events, classes to start your day and relax in the evening, special weekly live shows, including a video version of Insights at the Edge with an after-show community question and answer session with featured guests. I hope you'll come join us, explore, come have fun with us, and connect with others. You can learn more at join.soundstrue.com. I also want to take a moment and introduce you to the Sounds True Foundation, our nonprofit that creates equitable access to transformational tools and teachings. You can learn more at soundstruefoundation.org. And in advance, thank you for your support. In this episode of Insights at the Edge, my guest is Rabbi Danya Ruttenberg. Rabbi Danya serves as a scholar in residence at the National Council of Jewish Women. She's the award-winning author of numerous books, including Surprised by God and Nurture the Wow. She was named by Newsweek and the Daily Beast as one of the top 10 rabbis to watch and by Forward as one of the top 50 most influential women rabbis and called a wunderkind of Jewish feminism by Publishers Weekly. With Sounds True, Rabbi Danya is the author of a new eight-part audio series. It's called Mend the World, Spiritual Tools for Healing, Repair, and Justice. Rabbi Danya is someone who speaks uncomfortable truths, and this is the essence of having what she calls a prophetic voice, which is certainly the voice that we need at a time like this. Here's my conversation with Rabbi Danya Ruttenberg. Rabbi Danya, right here at the beginning, can you share with our listeners a bit about you and what brought you to the decision to become a rabbi? Well, I was raised in um, a very kind of typical American suburban Jewish household. Um, and, uh, you know, I had a bat mitzvah, uh, but it wasn't. I wasn't taught what it meant. Uh, we went to synagogue a couple times a year. We did a Passover Seder. Eh. Um, by the time I was 13, I decided I was an atheist. Uh, I was interested in philosophy. Um, and by the time I got to college, I somehow stumbled into the religious studies department by accident. Uh, it was interesting, right? It was history and it was literature and it was what really happened and it's the mysteries of what we can piece together with archaeology and it's textual analysis and it's living it's living philosophy basically um, I didn't have to believe what the people in these texts believed and um, then when I was 21 my mother died of cancer and I had run her hospice it's you know it's a whole um, about six month story of finding out that the cancer had come back and being back and forth. And then the six weeks of her hospice. And when she died, we did the funeral Jewishly because this is how you do a funeral. And people came to our house for a week uh, and brought us food and took care of us, which is called sitting Shiva because this is what you do. And I said the mourner's prayer during these times. And I kept going back to synagogue to say the mourner's prayer because that's what you do. And because I had spent all of this time reading books on ritual theory, I was able to open up the prayer book and kind of go, oh. <laughs> oh, that's what that is. And to see what was happening there in a new way. 
to understand it in a new way. And at the same time in grief, I became open, um, just open, I was broken open in a totally, you know, it's a way I'd never encountered and um, began happening, having what I would now call mystical experiences. At the time, it was just, I would have these experiences of, of everything kind of blurring and connecting and I didn't know what to call them. And I went looking for language. And so... Can we, can we just pause right there on, on that? Yeah. Can you tell me more if we were to put under a magnifying glass for a moment when you say I was having mystical experiences and everything blurring, like what was actually happening? Because sometimes okay. people refer to these things and it's a little vague and it's a little <laughs> yeah. like, what? what was actually going on? Okay, so I would, so here's what the story is, you know, I would um, walk around Providence, Rhode Island, which is where I was um, my last year of college at night and, you know, <laughs> kind of listen to Tchaikovsky on my Walkman and cry and look at the moon and, um, you know, I just, I'd stop and, and I'd look at the stop sign or the shadows on the sidewalk or whatever. And suddenly everything just, you know, first felt very sharp. It was very, very, very present and very clear in my head in a way that I'd never been. And then I don't know, the lines between me and everything else just didn't seem so clear. Like it was just, um, uh, it just felt like there was some, but that, that sense of, of where I began and everything else ends didn't feel so defined. It felt um, a little blurrier on the edges. Okay, so some kinds of like unitive awareness Yes. And as you know, later on, after I, I began meditating seriously, I would have um, more extreme experiences of experiencing oneness and really feeling the oneness of all things rising and falling and just changing shape. Um, but here it was just that that fuzziness, that beginning, that that um, understanding that the lines of myself and the lines of everything else might not be so clearly defined as I'd always thought of them. And a lot of this happened while I was you know, staring at the moon and there was just this big bigness. And um, I know I'm condensing like a three year process into a couple of sentences, but um, in my search, I you know eventually started using the word spirituality to describe these experiences. And when I started allowing that word in, the experiences got bigger. And when later on I started allowing the word God to come in, the experiences, boom, 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 you know, got way bigger. Um, it's like the, you know, it's like the, the fish that keeps growing when you give it a bigger tank. Um, so, you know, I just, the more space I was, allowing myself to, to have the, the further I was able to go almost. Okay. And then becoming a rabbi, because I think many people, especially in the contemporary world decide, you know, I'm spiritual, but not religious and no way am I going to take on all of that, you know, ancient language that's been passed down, mostly written by men within a certain <laughs> you know, set of uh, constraints, like, no way, I'm not taking that on. There's so much that doesn't fit. So right. how, how did you step into it and go, no, this is for me? Right. And let, it, let us establish that um, by the time I got to college, I was, you know, an atheist. And quickly after college, I was out as queer. Like, I, you know, I was very established in my um, non-patriarchal point of view, shall we say. Um, and by the time I was at all interested in Judaism. And um, after college, I had finished saying my 11 months of, um, of mourner's prayer 
at which point I had discovered that maybe Judaism wasn't so stupid after all, <laughs> and that maybe there was some deeper knowledge and that I had something to learn there. So I said, I moved to San Francisco after college because I could, because it was the late nineties and why wouldn't you? And um, I said, okay, I guess I need to know what synagogue I would go to in case I ever wanted to go to a synagogue. Not that I necessarily want to, but you never know. And um, I checked out many, many places. It was like a very Goldilocks experience. Um, there are very, very many flavors of Judaism in the Bay Area. And I'm glad that everybody can find the thing that is right for them. And there were a lot of flavors that were not right for me. And I was almost at the end of my rope. And I sort of said, okay, I'll just check out this conservative synagogue at the end of the bus line in the Richmond. And I walked in. And I sat down and the services felt correct. And then the rabbi opened his mouth. Um, his name was Rabbi Alan Liu. May his memory be for a blessing. And um, he was a god all. He was a, a great, great teacher. Um, as it happened, um, interesting for this community, um, he was a Buddhist for 20 years until he realized that he was a Jew named Alan from Brooklyn. You know, he sort of said he meditated down to his spiritual essence and his spiritual essence was a Jew named Alan from Brooklyn. And he wound, he wound up finding his way to rabbinical school. But the Torah that he taught was, came from this place of intense stillness. And his message was that this book is the story of all of our unfolding spiritual experiences and relationships with the divine right now. And, um, you know, my mind kind of went, and I followed him around for five years. And my relationship to things like keeping kosher and Shabbat and taking on serious Jew Jewish practice and understanding that Jewish practice is like a portable monastery um, that can change and transform you. Um, you know, it's, it, it's all his fault, basically. And um, the still small voice from within started to kind of go, rabbinical school? Very, very soon after I got to Beth Shalom, um, Rabbi Lushal, and um, I ignored it. And it got louder and louder and louder. And at a certain point, I had to, um, I had to listen. The power of a mentor, interestingly, mm -hmm. the power of yeah. someone who's embodying a tradition and how that inspired you. Now, when you mentioned him, you said, may his memory be for a blessing. And you, you, you said that um, kind of, I guess, because that's what a rabbi says when a rabbi is referring to a deceased person. But what does that mean? So in Judaism, when someone dies, um, we acknowledge they're, that they're kind of still with us, that the ways that their memory and everything that they left us uh, still offers us so many gifts and that their physical presence is not with us anymore, but everything that we have learned from them and all of the ways that they have touched us continue to give us unfolding blessings in so many ways. Um, and so we acknowledge that with this little phrase um, as we mention their name. Now, Rabbi Danya, with Sounds True, you've created this eight session audio series called Mend the World. And you referenced in your own journey to becoming a rabbi that at certain point, the still small voice inside started talking to you. And in this series, towards the beginning, you help people connect with their still small voice in a very interesting way. I was really surprised by this. And to be honest, I was kind of uh, shocked awake in that we can allow our still small voice 
to actually emit a scream. And I wanted to understand more about uh, why this is an important practice to you, how we do it, and how a still small voice screams. Are we talking, we're talking about the Rabbi Nachman practice. Yes. So Rabbi Nachman of Breslov was a great Hasidic teacher in 19th century, um, what we now, what's now Ukraine. Um, and he spent a lot of time kind of off alone, uh, vibing, I think would be the contemporary word. And, um, he developed a number of really powerful spiritual practices. One of which is this ability to sort of do an inner scream, a, a silent scream, a scream within within yourself, within your your mind, within your soul, within your heart, almost without saying a word. Um, and it is so powerful and and I wanted to share it with people I think it can be a really really powerful tool for expressing feelings that have been trapped I think it can be a really powerful tool for lifting up um, that which we buried and for just giving space to that which has been waiting patiently to be expressed and that we need to, to, to give space to in order to, to be freed up for any other purpose in this world. That it's a you know distraction and just being able to let go emotionally and spiritually and to give not just our thanks and our praise and our request to the divine, but also to offer up our screams. Why not that too? Let's do a Dora. So I think it's really important for, for sort of for all of these reasons, both because we have all of these screams inside and we need a variety of ways to express them, right? Some verbally when we're in the place that that's what can be done and to have other kinds of practices for other times, but also to be able to name that our screams are holy. Our agony is holy. Our desperation is holy. Our pain is holy. And we can lift this too up and to offer it up and say, here, take it. It's beautiful. Our agony is holy. Yeah. Towards the beginning of the series on mending the world, you talk about how we need to allow our bodies and hearts to process the stories of harm that we read in the news, that we hear about, that we know about, that we're in touch with. And I thought to myself, you know, so often I, I don't allow my body and heart to fully process uh, what I read and hear about in the world. And if anything, I actually become a little, I would say, dissociated or something. Like I'm kind of doom scrolling and there's no way I'm letting my body and heart process all of that. I don't even think I could, even if I wanted to, I'd be screaming, you know, all the time. So tell me more about that. How do we actually allow our bodies and hearts? Is that even possible to process what's happening in the world right now? So listen, we can't process everything fully. There is so much pain and harm in the world. Um, I want to acknowledge that. And if all we do is scroll and scroll and scroll and pretend that none of it matters, if, if we pretend that none of it matters to us in, in an existential way, that is terrible for us spiritually, right? That that act of dissociation, that act of numbing is terrible for us spiritually. And it's terrible for us as citizens, as, as people who are supposed to let things matter to us. Um, and we cannot 
be open wounds 24 seven about suffering happening halfway across the world, right? Because we do need to go about our days and yet we need to make space for it. We need to acknowledge the pain. And so dedicating space and time to experience those feelings, I think is, is really, really critical. And um, actually I have a new book that's, that's out, um, Unrepentance and Repair, that also talks about uh, you know, our obligations as bystanders of harm when we live in a world where we are constantly witnesses to this ongoing suffering and um, what's our role as bystanders, as receivers, as, you know, as um, secondary participants of harm. Um, and so we need to think through it spiritually and we need to think through it mere, m- m- we need to think through it morally as well in terms of um, what are our obligations here? And though we can't do everything, that doesn't mean that we can't do anything. Mm-hmm. What do you see as our obligations? We think, well, that's not, you know, that's that's happening over there. I'm not really involved with that. That happened before I was born. That's not really mine. You know, I'm, I'm working uh, on, I'm dealing with, you know, I got enough on my plate right here just with my family. Um, well, on repentance and repair has a lot to say about obligations. So, um, and and the ways we can mend the own, the harm in our own relationships and in our, in our own lives and institutions, right? Um, but ultimately, we have to do something. We have to pick our place on the boat, right? Every we need all hands on deck, and there's a lot of deck. And so we need to figure out what our sphere of influence is and, and to do that and to know that we cannot uh, fix anything single-handedly um, and that sort of savior mentality isn't useful anyway in the work of justice. Um, and we cannot be useful in every sphere, but we can show up somewhere and helps on something and and work actively and and regularly somewhere to make things better. And if everybody did that on something, then we would start to lift some boats, right? We would start to lift, lift up a lot of the pain that's in the world. Now, one of the curious things for me has been being, uh, deep into, uh, I also majored uh, in religious studies, deep into uh, spiritual literature reading, a lot of Eastern traditions, and seeing even through the work of Sounds True, many people who have mystical experiences, the world melts, they know they're interdependent, but yet it doesn't translate necessarily into a form of all hands on deck activism. And I've often tried to understand why for some people it does translate and why for other people, their life still seems, you know, people talk about it as like, you know, the wellness bubble or the spiritual bubble, some kind of bubble. And I'm curious what your your view is of that. It makes me um, a little bonkers to be honest, because if we are interlinked with all things and interconnected with all things, and I believe that we are, and I've had experiences that testify to that fact on a spiritual level. And of course my experiences are not complete external reality, just as everybody else's are not. But I, I too have had this experience described by mystics of every tradition. Um, if we are linked, interlinked with everything, that doesn't just mean the trees and the flowers and the people we like. It means the people who are suffering in wars that our government started. And that means the, the girls who are taking off their hijabs in Iran and getting brutalized by government police. As a result, that means that the earth that is currently in absolute crisis is part of our interlinked destiny. It means that 
uh, the people who are losing their autonomy and their dignity and sometimes their lives because Roe has been uh, rolled back are part of, the, of what we are interlinked with. It means that the trans people who are under attack nationwide are part of who we are interlinked with. And that interlinking involves obligation. It's not just about a narcissistic groovy feeling for me personally. It's about recognizing my interconnected obligation to the whole and recognizing that my purpose here on earth is to serve the interconnected whole that is to say other people and the earth. Okay, let me just push a little for a moment, Rabbi Danya, okay. uh, because imagine someone who says, my job on the deck is to sit here in radiant, you know, full lotus yoga posture, sending out rainbow waves. Mm -hmm. That's my job on the deck. What do you think? For people who think that their job is to sit radiant on the deck and to... Um, I don't know what bring. I'm bringing the light. I'm bringing the rainbow light. I'm I'm sitting here. I'm bringing the rainbow light. Isn't that a job on the deck too? I believe that we are a world in extreme, extreme pain, and we need people who are going to show up and help and be ready to move chairs and get coffee and, you know, make the, the Xeroxes, so to speak. Um, and we need teachers for sure. We absolutely need people who are going to hand over the tools of resilience, the tools of drawing from the deep well, the tools of ancient knowledge and the tools of staying connected through the long, long fight? No question. We need teachers. We need people who are going to pass on ancient tools. We need people who are going to help people to draw from the deep, deep well. We need people who are going to be offering up tools for resilience, for uh, understanding the big picture, for seeing what the work is really about, for uh, maintaining love even when it gets hard, for understanding the deeper meanings of solidarity, right? We need teachers, absolutely. Um, but no, I do not believe that sitting on the deck not doing anything is part of the project. That is my personal belief. I think we need people showing up in, in roles. And that is very Jewish of me, I recognize. And, I, you know, I believe that how we serve is by showing up and taking care of other people. Mm -hmm. That's the work. Now, in the series, Men the World, you talk about the prophetic voice and that I think many of us are feeling a call to embody a type of prophetic voice at this time. And I wanted to understand more, one, what you mean by that, and two, what we can learn from the Jewish tradition about the prophetic voice that can help us now. So... The ancient prophets, and I'm talking about the ones in the Bible, right? Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, Amos, all of them, um, spoke uncomfortable truth. That was their role, was to say things that were not always easy to hear and who they were saying them to and how they were saying them to differed depending on their roles. Right? Isaiah was in the court, and so he was constantly saying to the king, you are making a bad decision. Right? Don't become friends with the Babylonians. They are not your friends, right? This is going to lead us down the wrong path. 
our vision for a more whole world looks like this, not like that. Stop with the political scheming and keep your eye on the ball. And then he would say to the people, you're getting too wrapped up in the ritual stuff and you're forgetting that the whole point of our tradition is to take care of those who are socially marginalized, to feed the hungry, to not exploit your workers, right? This is the fast I desire, he said. Don't, you know, I don't care if you go to synagogue in your fancy suits, so to speak, right? But rather the fast I desire is that you feed the hungry. Uh, that's, that's what God wants. You know, whether or not you make it to the service at seven o'clock exactly on the dot is not the point. The point is that you walked by a homeless person and you didn't even make eye contact. What Judaism is that, right? That's Isaiah. And then you have Jeremiah, who is an outsider, who is basically, you know, he's giving over the same kinds of messages, but from a different point in society. And he is reviled because of it. He doesn't have that sort of insider posh situation and he's taking different kind of risks and he's paying significantly higher prices as a result. But that prophetic voice is about risking something from where you are in order to speak important truths about who we need to be, about how we have lost our way morally, about finding our integrity, about caring for, about showing up in solidarity, about, um, our, you know, our work needing to focus on those who are most socially marginalized, about letting those who are most marginalized lead, even though it might be most comfortable to keep your mouth shut and to let the whoever's in charge continue hogging the mic. Right? When prophetic voice is not, having a prophetic voice is not comfortable. It is not easy. There is sometimes a price. And for us to follow in the footsteps of the great and holy who came before us is, I believe, sometimes a moral necessity and You know, it's definitely it's an option for us in our change making work. Right? There are times when we know that we can open our mouths and say the thing that needs to be said. And we can make a decision about whether or not we are going to be that person. Can you give an example of a time when you exercised your prophetic voice and had to pay a price for it? What was the price? <laughs> Good God. Um, the number of times I, um, throughout rabbinical school and my early career, I was continually saying, well, what about, well, what about? I was the one in our Talmud class who would say, this is very nice that we're talking calmly and coolly about um, what's actually the sexual abuse of women. And I understand that this is a very interesting literary technique, but can we name what's happening here, people? Um, I brought a friend who was trans to school to answer people's questions. This was 25 years ago, you know, trans folks' uh, lives and needs were not as well understood as they are then, to, so that rabbis could be better understood and better equipped to um, serve trans congregants. My friend, I mean, my friend obviously thought this was a great idea and was happy to participate and got screamed at uh, by a dean because what if the Jewish Journal found out? Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I paid a number of institutional prices for that kind of thing. Um, and making some decisions about what other stories to tell. <laughs> um, 
More recently, I, it's public, made the decision to get, to make a substantial donation to an organization that supports survivors of sex trafficking as a, an offset to time that I'd participated in a fellowship run by somebody who I didn't know it at the time of applying was uh, an associate of Jeffrey Epstein's. And um, I've gotten, let, let's just say, I, you know, I've gotten very mixed reception in my community as a result of that choice because I named a, a very uncomfortable truth that a lot of people in my community have not wanted to look at. Mm -hmm. Now you brought that up and interestingly, your new book, which you referenced on repentance and repair, this whole notion of, are we willing to take the actions of repair? And there you are embodying that, uh, Rabbi Danya, good work. I, I, thank you. I mean, I just, for me, the work of repentance and it's not a note of a feeling that you have in your heart. It's, it's a set of actions and I, it, unrepentance and repair is about taking what I think are Maimonides five steps of the work of repentance. And they're all very victim centric um, and applying them to a number of things in our modern world, both our contemporary personal lives, but also very significant public problems like sexual abuse and systemic racism. But um, there are five steps and they're concrete steps. There are things you do. So, um, you know, you have to put your money where your mouth is, proverbially or literally. Sometimes. Can you tell us the five steps? Number one, confession. Own your harms fully, completely, no hedging, no what I meant, no, you know, my good intentions. We don't care. Just name, name what you did. Really face it. And ideally publicly, because then you, A, have accountability. You're telling people that you're going on a journey of change and transformation and you now are going to be having backup in that process. And B, it's an end to gaslighting for the victim, right? That you're now naming fully what happened and it was real. And now everybody sees that you know that and whoever didn't believe them now sees that. It's a putting the truth fully out there in the world confession. Number two, start to change. If you're still the same person causing harm, we're, we're not getting anywhere. So you have to, what is therapy? Is it doubling down on prayer and meditation, but with a spiritual guide who's going to help move you from where you've been? Is it calling your sponsor? Is it ditching the friends uh, that are always the bad influences and help, you know, help you make bad choices. Is it going on a journey of learning about anti-racism in a new way? Is it, I, I, you know, I don't know, what was the harm? What is the need for learning and growth? But you have to grow. You have to grow. Step three, amends. What does the person who was harmed need? What do they want? You can never undo what you have done. But what would help sew up the hole in the cosmos that you created? And that's done in conversation with them, not at them. And note that the person asking amends is already the person who's on the journey for change. We're not asking somebody who's um, totally uncooked to show up at the victim, right? Then we need them to be already doing the work. Then apology which is flowing organically from an open heart that's already doing this work and genuinely finally starting to get it as opposed to somebody who's checking off a box or God forbid has their publicist writing something, right? And then finally, step five, when the opportunity arises to cause that harm again, and there's always an opportunity to cause that harm again, you make a different choice. You have changed. You have transformed. You don't do that harm anymore. And so you go in a different direction. Very powerful. Uh, I do want to share that in preparing for this conversation and here in talking with you, 
I have uh, committed to a series of repair steps that I was considering, but I wasn't sure of. But I think the strength of your soul force made it uh, 100% something that I had to do. So thank you. Oh, now, I want to I want to so uh, go back to this notion of the prophetic voice for a moment, mm -hmm. speaking uncomfortable truths, because it mm -hmm. seems like there's sort of pitfall, which is in the world of influencers, and everybody wants the mic to speak what they want to say, that the prophetic voice can be distorted into, I'd like the stage, please, to say what's on my mind. It's not really speaking the prophetic voice. It's more speaking a kind of self-aggrandizing need for attention. So how do we sort that out for ourselves when we feel called to pick up the mic? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I mean, you know, this is where the work of spiritual practice is so necessary because it can help us to take that pause, to take those breaths, to do some discern discernment work. And I really believe that the best spiritual practice is not done in isolation, right? We need community and we need people uh, who can be our partners in the work of discernment. Uh, in Judaism, we talk about chavrutot, the your study partner, right? The person that's, the you know, chavruta is a uh, chavera's friend. And a chavruta is the person who is your, classically your study partner in classical Jewish texts, right? You picture the two people arguing across the table over a page of Talmud, like that's your chavruta. And we have chavrutot in all sorts of things in our lives. Like, hey, can I check in with you about this thing? And sometimes when we're just meditating, us and ourselves, we can get kind of caught in the circles of our head and our unhealed trauma and our whatever else. And having other people with whom we can check in and say, check me on this. Am I, am I right? Is this the, the right thing? Would this be correct? Um, is really critical. So for example, um, when I made the decision to donate that money, I wrote out a statement and then I sent it first to one group of dear friends to say, hey, workshop this, check me. Am I, am I on track here? Is this even the right thing to say or do? And uh, I got some really important feedback from people who are trauma therapists and experts in uh, all sorts of things that are relevant. And then I sent it to another group of people who know this community well and who are all either survivors of sexual abuse and or people who work in that field and got some more feedback because, you know, and these are people that I, I, I would trust to tell me if I was on the wrong track. People who I would trust to say, no, this is not it. You shouldn't do this. You are, this is a bad idea, right? And we all need people in our lives that we can trust who will tell us no. And sometimes when it's, when it's time to exercise big prophetic voice, we need those people first. And when it's time to speak up about the racism in a joke that's being made in real time in your staff meeting, sometimes you just got to open your mouth and say, that's not right. And you have to just own your moral code and own your understanding of what's fair and just. You need to be able to say, well, I have noticed that only men are on this panel. Right? I have noticed that, um, you know, this policy would be absolutely terrible for trans people. I have noticed, right? You, I mean, you don't always need a panel of people to workshop your statement to speak truth to power. Um, but when it's a, a tricky time, then you should check in with your people. Mm -hmm. When it comes to speaking uncomfortable truths at this time, what for you are some of the most uncomfortable truths that you want to speak to? I think that we, as a country, are still in deep denial about the climate emergency. 
and that we are in a deep denial about the degree to which Christian nationalism has been uh, as the culmination of 50 years of work on their part, 50, 60, 70 years of work on, on, on their part really has taken over parts of our country and that it's going to be many years of organizing and sort of the emergency that that is. Um, and I think we need to talk about the ways that capitalism influences so many of the things that we normalize. Um, you know, the sort of who, who and what is behind what we lift up as laudable and, you know, talking a little bit more explicitly about marketing forces, about philanthropy, about all of that. There are places and pockets where it's happening and so many places where this conversation isn't happening and it needs to be happening in an intersectional way because it's all, you know, it's systemic racism turtles all the way down. Now, Rabbi Danya, in your new series, you, you touch on a lot of these topics in different ways, offering spiritual tools for healing, repair, and justice. And interestingly, in the section on justice, you talked about how rest, the practice of rest, can and should be a justice issue. Can you talk about that? In the Torah, we are told, we are commanded to rest. And not just we, whoever we is that is hearing, but we and our family and our workers and the Levite that is in our gates, the Levite who does not own land and the widow and the orphan and the stranger, right? It's everybody in our community, those who do not have power, um, even our animals, right? Shabbat is the first labor law in, um, maybe maybe in, in history, I don't know, um, <laughs> definitely in our religious history. And, um, and it is a labor law. And it's a way of saying that we are not meant to be grinding all the time, that our humanity matters and everybody's humanity matters equally. And we need to, to live like that matters. And in our culture today, getting back to capitalism, we treat people as though their primary value is in their usefulness, right? During the pandemic, care rationing was stacked against disabled people. More disabled people died because they were deemed not as worthy of care because they were their lives were deemed less important because they were ultimately, if you drill it down, less useful to society, right? That does not mean their lives had less value. They were just disabled. And more disabled people died. Um, the exploitation of workers is so normalized in our country. The fact that we do not have labor laws that protect Amazon workers from working in COVID riddled conditions, from having to uh, you know what, pee in old Coke bottles um, along the way of their roots because they don't have enough time for proper bathroom breaks. I mean, it's a health and sanitation issue, right? The fact that our labor laws don't allow for that is incomprehensible. So when we decide to rest, it is a statement against this culture that says your only value is in what you do, is in how you produce, is in what you are for this culture, right? It's who you are matters, right? Your 
wholeness matters. Your self matters. Your refueling matters. You're pausing to take time for yourself. And we see this in activist culture too. There's a lot of burnout because people feel like things are so urgent that they're not allowed to take time for themselves and they feel guilty. It's like, no, you need to refill. You need to pause and and care for yourself even so that you can give up the cause but also because you matter these workers that you're fighting for matter and you matter too you're allowed to and um for everybody to say i'm going to rest it is a radical proposition in a culture that is designed to exploit them you're obviously a very high achieving person. You've written how many how many books at your relatively young age? Um, I'm 47. I'm not that young, but um, I've written three, and then we're up to eight, including the edited anthologies. Yeah, you're a very accomplished person. How has the practice of rest been for you? Was it easy to embrace it? Like, sure, you're like, well, actually, you know, I think I'm gonna go check my email. I realize it's Saturday. It's it's not quite sundown, but I mean, it's six hours it'll be sundown or no. Is it like, this is easy. This is what I need. Shabbat is such a gift. Um, I started keeping Shabbat in my very early 20s when I quit my job and went freelance. Um, and realized that I would spend, I was spending all day, every day, just hustling because when you're freelance, you're on the grind all the time. And that this was, this was the day, right? This was the antidote to my own burnout. And, um, and since then, what my Shabbat practice is, has taken a lot of different forms over the years, but, you know, now with three kids, uh, you know, there's a lot of, you know, snacks and card games, kind of chilling, uh, laziness, and it is so good and so needed and so necessary. I'm so grateful for it. Okay, Rabbi Danya, two more things I want to talk to you about in terms of mending the world. You quote the Hasidic master, Rabbi Nachman, as saying, all the world is a very narrow bridge. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? It means... I I almost don't want to answer that question because I think it means a lot of different things for a lot of different people. And in responding to this question, I don't want to take away from your or anyone else's reading of that line. And I want to read the whole line all the world is a very narrow bridge. The ha'ikal, the main thing, lo lefachad klal, is not to be afraid at all. Right? Um, it's difficult, this being a human being business. It is perilous. It is painful. It is sometimes horrible. Rabbi Nachman did not have an easy life. Okay, anything you might think about uh, 19th century Ukraine, um, you know, it was not easy to start with. And he himself lost basically all of his family to illness and his house burned down. And, you know, then he left this town because of the Cossacks and, you know, came to you know, whatever, like he was, he was a man who suffered and you have to just keep walking and you think about what you do on a very narrow bridge, trying to hold those twin poles of keeping steady. Do you look down? Do you not? And just keep walking, keep breathing, keep moving ahead. And you try not to be terrified as you take that next step. What if you are terrified? That's 
the the main thing is not to be. And I will tell you that Rabbi Nachman evidently struggled a lot with what we probably would call depression um, these days. And people have tried to, you know, diagnose him from afar. I'm not going to do that. But um, a lot of rabbis preach the sermons that we need to hear. Mm -hmm. I think he was teaching the Torah that he needed to hear himself. Mm -hmm. All right. Towards the beginning of our conversation, you shared a bit about your mom's death and what you went through in grieving her passing. And one of the comments that you offer in Mending the World, this audio series with Sounds True, is in Judaism, prayer and pain, prayer and weeping are in some ways deeply intertwined. And that really moved me because I think sometimes we think of prayer as something that's like all love and light and everything, not connected to our weeping. And I, I wonder if you can comment on that. In Judaism, we call prayer avodah shebelev, the work of the heart. Um, it is about taking what is on our heart and finding it, lifting it up, and I think offering it up to what I would call God. You can call it the divine, the great interconnectedness, everything, the universe, whatever words, just offering it up and out and saying, here, have it. And sometimes what we offer up is gratitude and sometimes what we offer up is longing and sometimes what we offer up is praise and sometimes what we offer up is anger and sometimes what we offer up is pain. Uh, the Talmud teaches uh, all the gates of heaven are locked except for the gates of tears which are never locked, right? Like, there's always room for our tears, for our heart to be broken open. And for me, that prayer, that connection, and I don't believe in vending machine theology, please. I, you know, my, my conception of a deity is not one that's like a man in the sky being like, oh, we'll, we'll give Billy a Porsche. Like that, that sort of prosperity theology is not it. Like you plug in, you offer up, you give out, um, you say, please take this, it's for you, it's not mine anymore, and you're transformed. And then you are more able to do the work you need to do in the world because you have connected with the big bigness and given what you need to give, and then you can go do your work. And sometimes what you need to give are tears and tears and tears and more tears. I should know, it was just Yom Kippur and I cried my face off, <laughs> right? That's, you know, we name the pain, we name the suffering, we let it out. To conclude, Rabbi Danya, can you lead us in some kind of blessing here at the end of our conversation for all of our Insights at the Edge listeners joining us right here? Something, something that feels natural and true. The first thing that popped into my head, I usually, I will say, I'm a very fond of improvisational freewheeling, spontaneous blessings. But the first thing that popped into my head, so I'm going with that, is the traditional priestly blessing. So I'm going to go with that. This is the blessing that uh, the high priest in the ancient temple in Jerusalem would offer to the people. And this is the blessing that many parents give their children on Friday nights. May God bless you and keep you. May the face of radiance shine upon you and bring you grace. 
יישא אדוני פניו אליכם, ונשים לכם שלום. May the face of all interconnectedness lift up to you and bring you peace. I've been speaking with Rabbi Danya Ruttenberg with Sounds True. She's the author of a new eight-part audio series. It's called Mend the World, Spiritual Tools for Healing, Repair, and Justice. Rabbi Danya, thank you so much. It's been so great to commune with you in this way. Thank you. Thank you. And if you'd like to watch Insights at the Edge on video and participate in after the show Q&A conversations with featured presenters and have the chance to ask your questions, come join us on Sounds True One, a new membership community that features premium shows, live classes, and community events. Let's learn and grow together. Come join us at join.soundstrue.com. Sounds true, waking up the world.